Hi, I'm Craig. I'm Ben. And I'm Derek. And this is Wrist Enthusiast Radio. Hi, everybody. Craig from Wrist Enthusiast here. And we are back with another episode of Wrist Enthusiast Radio. But things have changed a little bit. Um, Derek has joined the podcast as a full-time contributor, and we're going to get in a little bit to Derek's kind of background and his watch journey, because every time we bring someone new on, we want to give you know our viewers a little bit of background on you know why Derek is an expert in this space. So hey, Derek, how's it going? Hey, Craig and Ben, thank you so much for having me on Risk Enthusiast Podcast. Honestly, I'm really excited to be doing this because I've always wanted to do like a casual podcast format to just talk about watches. Um, all three of us, we create content in the industry of watches. So it's more fun to kind of like sit down and talk about the things that normally we wouldn't probably talk about and cover in short form. And now we get to kind of like breathe on some topics in the longer format. Um, but yeah, I'm excited and thanks for having me. Yeah, we're excited that you're able to join us. And for those of you that are watching this, you'll notice that this is the first video podcast episode. <laughs> We've been wanting to do this for a long time. And Derek, he'll get into his background, has graciously given us space to be able to do it. So yes, we're still going to be on you know Spotify and Apple Podcasts and all of the audio uh, podcast platforms, but now we're going to try and get everything video recorded to make it a little bit more engaging for our viewers and watchers and you know everyone that enjoys the podcast. So thank you, Derek, for that. Yeah, of course. It's my pleasure. I'm happy because like I put together this studio back in like 2022 and this is like where most of my videos get uh, recorded. It's in my store Carrot Co, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, but it just makes it easy because anytime there's like new product and I need to talk about it, I can just run upstairs, get the recording done and then, you know, put it back on the showroom floor or, or whatever. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy to have you guys here. Not a lot of people get to come inside yeah. the studio. Wow. And <laughs> it's cool. This is the first time I've been at, at your store and we've been talking about it for, for months and months. And I'm saying, I want to come by, shoot some content. So we're finally here and you know, the store is great. Thank you. Um, so I guess I'll talk a little bit about myself. Well, first we have oh, to do a okay. wrist shot. All right. First, we got to do a wrist shot. Every episode, before we get into the details, we do a wrist shot. And since you're the newbie on the podcast, sure. what are you wearing, Derek? So today I'm wearing a Grand Seiko Soko Frost reference SBGH295. I know there's people out there who know the references by heart like I do. Um, it's basically their Kirizuri ice blue dial. And I have it paired on a white cut to size rubber strap from d Lugs, which ben and i were talking about before the show because mm -hmm. he's thinking about getting it for his watch but yeah. I'll, I'll let him share what he's wearing yeah i guess i'm wearing the christopher ward bell canto in the i forget what they call it they call it some fancy name for the like dial but it's blue. ice blue it's also ice blue. ice blue yeah um and i was looking at straps because i love the grade two titanium bracelet on this but i envisioned something a little more playful like the right rubber so um, I love it. I literally just got it three days ago, so I'm in the honeymoon phase. Right maybe, now. maybe we'll hear a chime in the middle of the episode, oh, right yeah. on the hour. Yeah, we have uh, we have 35 minutes, something like that. Minutes. <laughs> so we gotta keep this going. I don't know if we have enough to talk about for 35 yeah. minutes, but if, <laughs> but if we do, yeah, we'll hear a chime. So I got the blue dial memo, but I did not get the ice blue dial I'm memo. Sure. I'm wearing the Gerald Charles Masterlink, which is their new integrated bracelet um that they released at watches and wonders i really like it super comfortable it's interesting because if you look at the links i remember we were at the gerald charles booth together and you got they were asking you what's unique about this watch and you got you got the answer right derek well what did i say <laughs> yeah. i don't remember so, so you know it has the same kind of case design as all of gerald charles watches the uh, the maestro is the other kind of reference um but it has like the smiley face on the bottom and so the bracelet on one side has that curve for each of the link but on the other side which is straight it's straight so there's a lot of thought that went into this, and it's super comfortable and super slim, micro rotor. So I have this in for review, and you know I'm enjoying wearing it for now. I'm I'm excited to see your review because um, I watched it and wonder it was my first time seeing uh, Gerald Charles. It's always such a tongue twister to say it. <laughs> yeah, and I'm always so used to saying Gerald Genta. Yeah, which is obviously the same the same person, man. the same yeah. man behind it. Um, but I was actually blown away cause I've only seen online and then yeah. to see it in person. I saw their open work skeletons yeah. and those really were impressive. Um, 
So I, I'm excited to see what you have when, yeah. when your review comes out. So for those that kind of don't know, there's Gerald Genta, which is now owned by Bulgari or LVM, LVMH, um, which was, I guess, Gerald Genta's first brand, but he sold it. And then he went and started Gerald Char- Charles, and he couldn't use the name Gerald Genta because he sold it. So he had to use his middle name. So it's Gerald Charles. Charles and yeah. then he apparently worked there until he... Um, passed away and you know now it's kind of I think they were doing a lot of kind of custom stuff or stuff for clients for a long period of time but very limited and now they're building a brand still you know independent still under I think a thousand pieces a year but a little bit more That's crazy yeah <laughs> at that level years. too yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nuts so anyway um, now let's get into a little bit about Derek's watch journey Derek I, I find you very interesting because you do both content creation and you're on the retail side. So it's kind of a great mixture. Um, so- yeah. Um, basically, I, well, in the, in the whole industry right now, there's not a lot of watch authorized retailers who also make content. There's a lot of dealers who make content, but yeah. not like ones working directly with the brands. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I always found that angle interesting. When I first started So I I guess I got to backtrack a little bit. How I got into watches first is actually through my parents. So my mom and dad both immigrated here from New York and uh, sorry, from Taiwan and Hong Kong to New York. They both worked in a flea market. They started like a little jewelry shop and they were selling like five dollar analog watches. Um, I shared a video recently of my dad on Forbes for AAPI month for this month in May. So he was talking about that a little bit and they like slowly over time just kept reinvesting every dollar they had into their business. So everything they made, they would put back. My dad even told me he even took uh, equity out of his house one time to buy inventory for one of our brands just so we can sell and to make this business work. And now we're 40 years past that. My dad is still in the business today. So he, you know, but he's not as active. Obviously um, he, he gets a little, little break now. (laughs) Yeah. He deserves it. After uh, 40 years, you would hope so. After 40 years. Uh, he's kind of the guy that also doesn't want to, like, he would be t- so bored doing nothing. Yeah. He's like, and I think I get that from him completely because, so when I f- came here full time, it was 2016, but even before then, like every summer I would come work for my parents and we had different stores around Flushing before we have this flagship location. So I had a lot of like experience when I was like still early in college, like selling watches and like, yeah. you know, I'd be going to college and then coming home for the summer, selling like five, six thousand dollar Omegas yeah. to people and then coming back to school. And, you know, that's where I got a lot of like experience. I ended up going to some other companies before I joined my family's business. So I did get some like outside experience in from- the watch industry. No, no, no. Like what a, did you do before? Uh, I, I used to work for Adidas Okay. Uh, as Very a store cool. manager. So I was there when the Yeezys launched, and that's why I had <laughs> I had oh, two, <laughs> the first original Yeezy, um, the Turtle Dove, and the Pirate Black. And then um, before that, I was working for AT and T. Uh, they had like a retail program that was like fresh out of college, and so I had joined them. And I learned a lot of like the good thing about going to these companies first is you learn a lot of structure. Yeah. And then when you come into a family business or like an entre- entrepreneurial business, you realize that like. The structure is not really the same. It's yeah. much more like, it's very much more like mom and pop style, yeah. even if the facade looks like yeah. the way it looks. Well, my my dad's in has in a family business, which I'm not involved in, but I've always thought that like even before you go into it, you kind of need that outside experience. You need someone that's not your family member telling you what to do because the dynamic between like your dad telling you what to do and someone that you don't know or haven't grown up with your whole life is completely different like you can't just be like no i'm gonna do whatever yeah that's 100 percent true but like so for me i didn't think i was gonna join the family business i kind of like it's funny as uh, i'll say it now but like i actually didn't care about watches for a long time even though it was like the business my parents had i always kind of thought like oh why would someone spend like (laughs) over a thousand dollars on a watch it's kind of ridiculous and um, it's funny, I'm uh, I'm totally fine saying that because obviously where I am now and like yeah. what I do now is like completely 180. But um, the, the thing that switched for me was like back in 2014 when I was still working for uh, AT&T, I was in Florida, I was, I, was at, um, I was going to work and then my dad called me and he was like, oh, like, do you mind moving back to New York? And I was like, oh, like, uh, you know, 
what's going on. And then he told me my mom, she actually had cancer. Oh. And so when I found that out, I was like, I just dropped everything. Yeah. I quit my job right away, moved back to New York, took me a little bit of time to like pack up and drive back up. And then when I came back, I didn't work for a little bit. I just stayed home with my mom for like about half a year. And then, you know, eventually, unfortunately, she passed from a rare cancer. And during that whole period of time, I started to realize and like see firsthand, like how much effort and like blood, sweat and tears and sacrifice my parents put in to like give me and my sisters like yeah. to send us to college and have us like live like comfortably. Yeah. Even though they didn't grow up, my parents themselves didn't grow up with that. And so I felt like this deep purpose, like, you know what? It doesn't matter if at that time I didn't care about watching. It doesn't matter what I care about right now. All that matters is that I help contribute back to my family. Yeah. And I always find that funny because like once I put my mindset in that category, when I started opening my mind to just work in the industry around 2016, then I started to enjoy watches. Yeah. because then I had my own reason to like it. It wasn't because my parents were telling me and they still didn't tell me to come. They were like, whatever you want to do. But I just felt it was right. So I'm going to skip a little forward. Um, thanks for letting me share my story, by the yeah. way, too. Because yeah, like, awesome. and not a lot of people know it. I don't talk about this yeah. a lot. I had no idea. Yeah. yeah, it's weird. Like always, I've been wanting to do like a, even like a, my collection episode um, yeah. for YouTube, uh, YouTube video. And it's just like weird talking about yourself. So this is like, I feel like a good format to share it yeah. because I mean, like that's what I did on the first episode and that's what Ben did on his first episode. So, yeah. you know, we want everyone to get to know you. Yeah, I appreciate you guys creating like a cool space for me to like share that. Yeah. Um. So then 2016, I started working full time in my parents store. I was just learning, like just absorbing and learning everything. I did everything from like shipping to sizing bracelets, changing batteries, selling watches, like ordering all everything. And I still do a lot of that today, mm -hmm. um, except a little bit, little, a little more like back end yeah. now because of like my new roles. But um, it was 2018 or 19 is when I started Minutemon on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And that was just a fun Instagram page because I was like, oh, I now that I really like watches, I want to like talk about the watches like I buy and all this stuff. So like I bought my first Grand Seiko. That was like the first watch I spent money on of my own mm -hmm. to buy a watch outside of like a swap. You got a pretty good deal, right? I, I, know, <laughs> I, I don't know I the owner. <laughs> I know the owner, let's just say. Um, and so... Yeah, I bought a Grand Seiko and then on Minutemon on my Instagram, I would like post photos of it. It was just like iPhone photos yeah. at first. And like back then I was like scared to tell people that I was an authorized dealer or that I worked for an authorized dealer because I just had like, I felt like I was entering a space where everyone knows so much and I didn't want to come off like, I don't want to come off. I don't want people to have the impression that like, oh, you're only making content because you want to sell something to me. Yeah. Like I want to come in because I'm also an enthusiast. I just happen to also work in the industry too. Right. And I see a lot more of that today too, just in our landscape, like other yeah. creators that we know are people or people who are in working directly with brands or people who are actually passionate about watches. And it yeah. wasn't always that way. It was, it was a lot of just people who know business, but not people who cared about yeah. watches yep. in the, the enthusiast or collector mindset. Um, so then fast forward, 2019, made my first YouTube video. It was on Grand Seiko again. Um, <laughs> and that first video, um, it was basically like a new collection Grand Seiko had yeah. coming out, the USA Seasons. We were a dealer for them, um, you know, around that time too. We still are. And we were one of the first stores to get like an early shipment for some reason. And so I was like, whoa, I should like make a video on this. So. I slapped together like a video with one of my friends who he does like wedding for videography too. So I want to shout out Matt because he was my first video and got it together. Um, and then we uploaded it and like, I was pretty surprised that the first week it did 60,000 views wow. and I had like less than like 10 subscribers. <laughs> wow. And I was like, Oh damn, like this is fun. Like, yeah. I like that. That felt good. It was like so unscripted and let me keep doing that. So yeah. Now, over the years, as I've been doing a lot of YouTube um, and also creating short form and long form content, now I've like, you know, last year was a big year for me because my YouTube channel hit 100,000 subscribers. So That's after awesome, five years yeah. of posting video, yeah. uh, four or five years, I finally hit 100K and um, I'm still bringing that energy now into yeah. everything else like YouTube, um, Instagram and TikTok and the other platforms. And, we'll uh, see how long TikTok lasts. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what happens with TikTok. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> 
it's going to stay? Um, I honestly, I think it's going to stay because there's so many things that are connected to it. But I, I'm at the point where it almost doesn't impact me if it stays or doesn't stay. Yeah. Because TikTok, I don't think is my main platform. Yeah. It's a great platform, but um, I still feel like Instagram and YouTube are my main ones. But maybe you have a I different I feel opinion. like brands don't really, like the Swiss are be- kind of, you know, slow to adapt to everything. So I yeah. feel like they always ask about uh, Instagram and YouTube and for us, the blog, um, but never really no. hear much discussion of TikTok. Yeah, I I started on TikTok, obviously, so I started posting videos, but I find that it's all, like, I'm Instagram focused now. Yeah. And I don't know what it is, and I see this with a lot of other creators on TikTok, too. Like, they kind of, like, it goes in trends. So, like, if watches are popular on TikTok for whatever reason, whether they're trading on 47th Street, those videos will get a lot of views, and then your videos get a lot of views. But if people aren't caring about watches as much and they're not trendy, they will suppress views. I just noticed that personally. I don't know about you, but... It's crazy. It's so different. I haven't done like a not a lot of analysis on TikTok because like, again, I don't like focus that much on it. I've always thought Instagram was the main platform just because yeah. that's like where I know so many people even before all of this yeah. happened, just like other collectors and everyone mm-hmm. would post their collection online and everything. Um, but I think Instagram is still like the main one. And then YouTube, I don't, I don't know. YouTube is like either second or at the same level because it's a different market. Too. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's how I see it. So I have a question. So I've talked to like other authorized retailers and they have told me that the brands want a lot of control over kind of what goes on the, at least the brand uh, on the retailers like Instagram, like Rolex, for example, like you can't even do your own photos. They, have, yeah. they send you the photos. Do you run into that issue with Minutemon um, or doing stuff with Carrot and Co? Is there like, you know, negotiation and in, in in the back end that goes on so you can kind of be creative so that's actually a really great question and that's why i started minutemon is because our store page carrot co has its own instagram has its own facebook and when the brand send us vi- uh, photo or video assets you know we post those on carrot co page but minutemon is my page mm-hmm. i can talk about what i want to talk about i talk about brands that we don't even carry sometimes just because that's like what i care about and I want it to feel more organic. Like, yeah. this is what I like. Here's some stuff from my store as well every once in a while. Um, but as long as I post on Minutemon and it comes from my opinion, I don't run into any issues. And actually, a lot of the brands encourage it. They yeah. ask, now they're asking, why don't you feature this watch or f- why don't you feature this one? And, you know, like, so that's like the direction it's going in more so now. I feel like there's been like a slow acceptance of Instagram and creators actually creating because like you said when I first started Instagram it was just photos first of all and it was like here's my watch in front of the Empire State Building (laughs) you know and and I think a lot of this is TikTok influence but it's you know become a lot of like you have to actually like think about what you're doing and you know like put together something edited and you know that tells a story um though on instagram i do think that you can do like wrist rolls and stuff like that that's still in photos that can still do well um in a way that they won't do well on tiktok but i think that is you know the tiktok influence but it's also brands are like understanding that that's how you're going to get engagement you just can't have like a highly processed shot that looks like it's made you know in photoshop completely Yeah, I think that you guys would probably would agree with what I'm going to say. But like, you know, when we first started shooting photos of just wrist rolls on our on our watch, there's no staying power in that because someone could repost it and they could cover your caption. They can cover and they can take your video. That's happened to me a lot. Yeah. And um, I started creating like short form video because I was posting like, you know, short clips of wrist rolls and stuff like that. And I saw people copying. And on top of that, I used to put like more music. And then on different platforms, music is like yeah. licensed yeah. by different people mm-hmm. or different groups and you run into those issues. So I was like, well, what can I put here instead of just silence? Like I would just put my own voice. Yeah. I'm already doing YouTube. Might as well like talk about the watch I'm yeah. doing. And so I, I know both of you guys create your own original content as well now. And you would probably agree that using your own voice and your own opinion on whatever watch you're talking about has a much stronger staying power than like just taking a really good photo and having that go viral viral. Yeah, no, no, I agree with that. I mean, and it just shows like the progression of 
Instagram like over the years and, and what brands are looking for. But yeah, I mean, creating your own content because then people come back for you and yeah. and for your like identity as opposed to just, oh, that's a cool, you know, watch. You know, yeah. people, you can see it anywhere on your, like my whole Instagram explore feed is just like watches. Mine too. And, 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 and that like, you know, the whole punching thing that people are doing now. Oh, yeah, that, 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 okay. We're not doing, we're not doing that here. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't, you're going to cut right here. Um, I a hundred percent agree with you with the whole, like speaking and talking about the watch. It's really hard. I've noticed like, like you both, like it's all about retention and keeping people yeah. interested. And that's very hard when you want to get into the nitty gritty, when you're a super watch nerd and you're like, you want to put out a good video so people like it, but you also like want to get views curious how you balance that because it's like you might not be able to include everything because maybe you're just interested in it or do you just kind of go nuts um i think like talking about trends for for example there are some trends that i'll jump on just because it's fun and i'm like oh you know what? i'll just do it for fun so you are like, gonna you are, you are gonna do that i don't know if i'll do that one i've seen that one but like there's some other trends that i find really <laughs> funny and i'm like it'll just be fun like there's it doesn't need to always be serious yeah, and it's, it's like kind of fun for the audience every once in a while um, but then the other one is like, I, I guess like, I don't have an exact formula to how I create. It's just more so like, what kind of content do I want to see? Yeah. Like when I go on my, my page, am I like listening to a lot of people or am I stopping when I'm actually going to learn something? And I yeah. find that I tend to watch a lot of creators that are not in the watch industry. Mm -hmm. I always have done that because, um, well, like part of my background, um, I used to do a lot of break dancing, like for like ten years. Are we gonna get you on the podcast doing break dancing <laughs> at some point? Well, there's no space here, so we're not gonna do that. Okay. There's actually like a, a cool video I want to talk about. I want to do about like the similarities between horology and break dancing, and I don't even care telling that concept because I know no one can do it before me. Yeah. <laughs> because whatever idea I have is like no one can copy me and do it. Um, so I don't even care about all the break dancers that watch are now going to start learning about watches. They're going to start learning about watches. <laughs> yeah. But I have a head start. So, <laughs> but like, so those are like some fun concept, like, Oh, what's something cool that you wouldn't normally put together? Or like, what's some, something you wouldn't normally think about on a watch. And, um, you know, I was watching MKBHD on YouTube. He's, yeah. uh, one of the biggest tech reviewers the and he's the best. Yeah. He's like the standard for that. And he was talking about how, um, you know, he tries to think about like special features on a new, you know, tech product. And that's how he focuses. Um, sorry, the whole reason I brought up the whole breakdancing thing <laughs> is because um, in breaking, like when you like breaking is all about like being original and mm -hmm. like it's like that whole hip hop kind of, um, you know, uh, culture is like you want to come out original. You don't want to come out looking like someone else or doing something like someone else. And I kind of that's so ingrained in me that I don't want to look like another creator. That's why I try to just create things that make sense to me. I don't have to jump on every hot news that yeah. comes out because some things I don't really have a stake in and I don't need to talk about it. I don't need to weigh in on everything. Um, but that's why I think when I think of concepts, I just think of like, what is no one talking about right now? Yeah. Which is really cool to bring up. Yeah. Um, example is the Cartier Santos Rewind. That was a cool Like video. about how clockwise and counterclockwise. That was like, I, I, I had that fact in my mind for a while. Cause I did another video about why is time clockwise. Mm -hmm. Um, and I learned that actually from, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, yeah. the astrophysicist. Yeah, I love him. So he was talking about how clockwise is clockwise. That's where I learned it from. So I didn't take it from another watch person. I took mm -hmm. it from it. Someone I enjoyed yeah, watching. Science. Yeah. Yeah. And then I applied it to our industry. And that's how, that's how, that's like basically how I would create. It's just taking things I like and then somehow linking it back. It's like, you watching your favorite TV show does nothing to do with watches, but then still like able to talk about the watches in the show yeah, and like how that relates to today. Well, that's why I loved Interstellar so much because it was like a amalgamation. Oh, my yeah. two favorite things like space and, and watches. And watches. Yeah. 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 That was, that's a great movie. Yeah. I find it like sometimes I just like don't know like what's going to like something will do really well on Instagram and then on TikTok I'll not, I'll get like no views and so TikTok is a little bit beyond me. I just I just hit a thousand <laughs> followers on TikTok. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's much to write home about. But I was actually talking to a girl I know that's like mid twenties, and I was, and I had like one video of it was like the Grand Seiko flagship mm -hmm. store opening, which you were there. Um, 
but I was like, why did this video do so well on TikTok? And it did well on Instagram as well. And she was like, well, it's like you took me on an adventure. You did this and then you did this and you like want to stay um, and like watch and see what you did next. So when I think about some of the videos I do, especially with like very interactive things, I think about like what would keep me watching and like what does this, you know, event or this place have that's interesting to me? Like, what would I be like, oh, that's cool. And then be like, what's next? Oh, that's cool. And so for some of my creation, you know, especially event-based creation, that's what I try and do. Like put myself in what I would think is interesting. But, it, you know, sometimes you're just completely off base and, and you get yeah. it wrong. Yeah. I mean, sometimes there's just events where you just have to, like, just capture what's going on. Yeah. And it's like, oh, it doesn't matter if I have my own original take. Like, it's, the importance is the event this time, not, yeah. not what I think about it. Yeah. Right. And, and sometimes, the and I think it's hard for the brands, too, but sometimes there's these events that they think are so interesting. But you go to them and you're like, I want to you know, like support the brand because I really like the brand, but there's not that much interesting here. And it's, I, you know, I know it's not going to do that well, but I'm going to create something anyway. It's, I, that's every single time I go to an event. I have, I, <laughs> I literally have, I bring the the camera, the DJI camera that you're just talking about. <laughs> Don't use it. And I'm like, all right, I have my idea. And when you get there, the music's too loud. Yeah. Like there's too many people. Nobody's like wearing the watches you want to cover or something. And you're like, I just can't. You're just like, I'm just going to scrap something together. And yeah. So it's funny because recently I'm not going to say which brand, um, a brand had an, an event and, but they also invited some press to come the day earlier and you know and we were able to kind of see like close up in a quieter setting a lot of the stuff that you may not be able to get like when the place is filled with you know hundreds of people right. and so i actually filmed a lot of the stuff the day before and then when i got there i was like okay crowd shot um and some of the like stuff that was unique to to the uh, actual event so i thought that was like a kind of interesting way to do things and yeah you know like i'm filming some of it the day before but it's stuff that you could have done that day so i don't feel like it's inauthentic um it's just like allowing you to actually like showcase it in a way that you know the viewers will like can actually like get a feel for it rather than trying to like sneak around people and, yeah. and do it. Yeah. I think that makes sense. I mean, I would probably do that too, just yeah. cause you, I think, I feel like the focus when you go to a watch event is whatever watch they're yeah. featuring. That <laughs> yeah. day. And if you don't really get like a close up of that, it's yeah. like, um, I think I know a lot of people are there to see what that watch is. Even if it's for like a split second, they just want to see what it looks yeah. like. And then later you could do like an intro video, like this is what I saw at the event. And then later when you actually have time to sit down, you can like talk about it more yeah. deeply and in more like a calm setting or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, one thing that you guys do really well that is easy for me when I go to these events, because I film a lot on my phone and I find that a lot of my footage just may be like less professional, you would say. It's more like a impersonal sort of thing. Like I could film this video and send it to my friend. Um, that's kind of like what, how I like to do it, but you guys yeah. are much more like, and you could tell on YouTube, like I cannot, I can't make a YouTube video, but you guys have sexy watch footage and your stuff's really good. Um, but what was I saying? Something about sexy watches. It's like hard to cover them because it's hard to photograph. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's hard to get the really nice watch footage. And when you see people that can do it, it's like the craziest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. I, so I actually like what you do a lot because I think part of your success is the re is the fact that it feels personal. It doesn't feel yeah. too scripted. Sometimes being too studio like yeah. is bad because it looks like an ad for the brand. Yeah. I mean, there's a certain level of quality that's okay, but like, mm -hmm. you know, having like just like, oh, look what I saw on my friend's wrist at this party is yeah. like totally fine. And yeah. I love that, you know, because like if you go back even like before TikTok all the content was pretty highly produced. Like if you look at like the Peter McKinnon kind yeah. of level, you know, he's like a well-known like photographer on YouTube and yeah. Yeah. Instagram. Like I think he, like what he would do, and quote me if I'm wrong, but like he would post, you know, he'd take pictures and then he would post his best photo on his feed. And yeah. that would get like hundreds of thousands of likes. Yeah. And I think it's like created this culture of like everyone wanting to just post the best photo yeah. that you took versus like just capturing like even just the more natural stuff like on your camera roll and so that's what i like what you do a lot and that's actually what i've been trying to do more of is yeah. like i want to do a mix of like stuff in the studio 
stuff interviewing random people on the street but then you know like mix it all together so that way all together as a whole picture it feels like there's a lot to enjoy like yeah and it's also better as a content strategy because now you're hitting people like maybe i never would have watched your video because you know you only talk about this brand but you went up to someone else and let them talk about their watch now i'm interested i like what you did at watches and wonders that was cool doing all those interviews thank you yeah um I, I I was telling Craig this while we were at the show, and I wish you could have came. And yeah. I'm sure you will come in the next, next future. Year, yeah. yeah, and maybe we'll have we'll a, a podcast, we'll have a, this enthusiast podcast. Yes, to the next year. Year. Yeah. We will so have... Mark your calendars. Let's see 2021. <laughs> One year from now. <laughs> yeah. Um. But basically, like, in the last few years, because I've been going to watch shows since 2016. I've been to Basel World until Basel World died. And then I went to SIHH <laughs> until that ended. And then Watches and Wonders is basically both of them together, yeah, yeah. but now in um, in Geneva. And over the last few years, I started to see more and more people come. Like it, it used to be just the media coming yeah. with like production crew and yeah. all the people. And now I see more retailer retailers like myself coming with like a whole crew yeah. to film things. And I'm still shooting everything by myself primarily. Um, so when I saw like people coming in with crews and they were like getting earlier access to shoot the footage, like at Watches and Wonders, it doesn't matter to be first yeah. because like everything, everyone's going to be kind of saying the same thing anyways. Yeah. Like Rolex is new this, Cartier's new that, right? So I was like, you know what? Like I'll grab my footage, but like, I only get to see uh, like a lot of these people in this room once a year. Yeah. So I'm going to go like talk to them. And so yeah. after like three days of just looking at watches, I was like, let me just go up to all my favorite creators. Even if I don't know them, like we yeah. only know each other online, just say hi. And then like everyone was down to record, which was super cool. Because awesome. everyone's like, yeah, let's like just talk, do a quick yeah. section. And the best thing about doing shorts is like, you know, if we want to sit down and do something like a podcast, you have to like really block out a time yeah, yeah. set like an hour. But like short form, I'm like, it's not even going to be a minute. And everyone yeah. has like, when you're watching one, you can catch someone walking in the hallway and do one minute. And yeah. it's so well, easy. It's funny. Derek and I were like leaving and we were walking out and he's like, wait a second. I, you know, you saw a bowl of salmon, I think. And you're like, I need to get something with him. And yeah. I was like, okay. I was like, I'll go record something over there for that minute and meet you near the exit. So yeah. yeah. The one thing like with watches and wonders while we're on the subject, I, like it was my first one. So, you know, a little bit overwhelming. And I just feel like you learn so much in that like week about like what, to take with you like what i took to the Palexpo the second half of the week was so different than all the stuff i was lugging around Yo, you the were first carrying time. so much yeah, i know it was staring like well you had like a suitcase that you like rolled around so come on man yeah that's <laughs> awesome um, but that's uh, that suitcase is through years of experience because i used to bring a backpack and then a messenger bag but then i'm wearing a suit all day yeah. and it would crease my suit and then your shoulder gets tired because you're on your feet all day so I, I started bringing a mini suitcase. He was really pushing this mini suitcase. I think he gets an affiliate commission for I everyone. Did, that, honestly, everyone it's, that, it's, it's, it's Ramoa. Ramoa. I don't get anything from them. They're LVMH, but I don't get anything from them. Yeah. What do you put in your suitcase while you're there? I have it it's somewhere. I'll grab it later. It's in one day. We'll here do it over over here. Here. <laughs> we, we can overlay what's some mirror wall of like what's in Derek's um, bag. So it's like a pilot luggage, and basically it's made for like putting documents in. Um, it's like absurdly expensive for what it is yeah. but i kind of like that it is because it kind of matches being in luxury watches um but i took out like the laptop sleeve and this year i brought like a table cl- i used to bring tripods yeah but this year I, I wanted a lighter setup so i brought like these smaller tripods and then i brought like a table clamp like something that literally comes yeah. on a table and you can shoot 90 degrees like down the table oh, nice. and yeah. that's why i needed the suitcase because that thing it kind of looks like the barrel of like a rifle yeah and like um, I didn't know how else to carry that unless I put it in a backpack, but again, I didn't want to yeah. crease the suit. So that's like the biggest item there. And then everything else is just miscellaneous, like audio gear, camera gear, yeah. external batteries. Cause you need to charge your stuff all day. Like I was bringing like my, my camera, like I brought my camera obviously and my like camera tripod, but the second half, I have this like iPhone tripod and like one of our cameras is actually on it right now. You yeah. can pull off the, the iPhone part, but when I was like filming, I was filming all my B roll, video B roll on my camera, on my phone, because yeah. it's like 4K, 60 frames per second. It's just easy, quick. And like, I just feel like it's more dummy proof because like some of like the video stuff, if I'm not like in my, you know, studio, yeah, my apartment, yeah. like yeah. setup, like I'm not sure that sometimes it doesn't come out as well as I would hope in the camera. 
or I mean, I, my phone is probably 90% as good and I can be sure that it's going to be good. So the second half I was used, I brought my iPhone, uh, tripod and was just using that overhead so I could be like this with, you know, with the watches and stuff like that. And I was like, that changed my whole entire show. Like my shots on my second half were so much much better. But the other, the other thing that I would have done is I had, you know, I had another person come and which was great, but like having like a video person, um, and a photography person because I'm sufficient at it, but not, you know, expert level at this point i think is something like if you can have that second person that's who i would take yeah i would agree with that too i would i would definitely prioritize having like a videographer or photographer Mm because they can capture everything for you and that way like normally if you're in a meeting then you can do the social aspect like talking to the brands and stuff like that and let someone else just work and take all the photos yeah and um yeah i think that's a good idea too yeah it's a great idea it's hard to find really good photographers yeah, it is. It real I like I know maybe two or three that I really, really, really like. Yeah. Obviously they're like taken up and you're like, oh yeah. and are they product they're in the industry too? Yeah. Watches. Yeah. yeah. In the industry. Well that's the thing about watches is like my mom's prof- professional photographer. So bring your mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, seriously, just teach your mom. Yes, yeah, yeah, that was so easy. Just teach her because she like it's watches like she's like i cannot do that it's because all the reflective and yeah. all that she could she do it like yeah you just like white birds and shit yeah you know, like i think she could all she needs yeah it's just a different subject like if she's shooting portraits for the most part all she needs to know is like i mean you have the inventory of watches yeah you can just let her practice yeah yeah and basically she could get it done and it'd be really easy to bring your mom like you know, be so easy it'd be much easier than to like you know hire someone you don't know or you haven't tried with and like yeah, and you don't have to pay you know, her, to pay her. Like, she is her rate she high. might work for free <laughs> yeah. i want to get some more headshots and stuff like that because i finally got a good one. Oh, and, nice uh, she was like we had to do them so i'll bring a watch and we'll nice. get it done is that yeah. for like social media like the new photo or yeah, just in general I, have, um, I feel like i just like doing this it's very professional compared to like other quote unquote influencer stuff you would say. Yeah. So it's having like looking a little bit better. Like my my photo for the longest time was me in these like glasses. Not <laughs> I remember that photo. Here. Yeah. <laughs> this, yeah. This guy me, he's like, I'll make you a, a profile picture for free. I'm like, oh, okay, that's that's great. But then I got headshots done by uh the guys at Bezel. Nice. And um it was just like a did they a feature, but it functioned as a good picture. For Do you me. feel like people like won't recognize you if you change like i was file. nervous about it but i knew it had to be done because if i wanted to grow and like have people know me and work with brands and stuff like that my picture had to not look like i was partying yeah <laughs> at the time that makes it, sense it was yeah. like just post college or two years post college but yeah yeah that makes mm-hmm. sense it's like the more you start working with the brands you realize that like yeah they do kind of prefer i mean it only helps yourself if you yeah. like market yourself in a way that looks professional um, so that way they feel comfortable working, yeah. especially if they're new to you and your brand. Yeah. And that's like me too, as well. Like I think I got a lot of that out of my system in college. <laughs> I don't really do that anymore. I'm always working and like making videos and talking to people and doing a bunch of other stuff I'm working on. So like, I don't really do any of that anymore. So it's not even me. Ben, I didn't yeah. ask you this. Are you yeah. full time with what you yes. do with watches and everything? I am. That's so yeah, cool, man. Too, but yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really cool for me. Um, I've actually been full time for a long, like a year and nine months. Damn. Yeah. Started, Dude, that is yeah. props. That is not easy. It's yeah. not um, as a creator. It's still I'm still working on it, but uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Yeah. There you go. Oh, there's the chime. I hope, I hope we can get that on the. Is it, is it going to chime again, or you have to put it up to the mic? No, it does once per hour, so I don't. All right. Probably won't, but you can you can probably clip it, and hopefully we'll hear that. <laughs> then we can record it. And I can, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, true. But yeah, I started with Bezel, working with Bezel, and they're the best people. That's very opposite of what you do, but um, they're awesome, and I did creating content for them and stuff like that. And uh, now it's been full time, just me, not working for them or with them for yeah. a year and three months or something. Yeah, yeah. It's funny though. You both of you kind of started out as like personalities, where I, no one knew who I was for the long, like maybe up until like a year ago, um, yeah. because it was like I'd never put myself on camera, and then like I was like, that's what brands were asking for, like YouTube and all that stuff, and that's I saw that's where Instagram was going, and so I kind of more reluctantly got into like being on camera and i enjoy talking about it but i'm like still like 
somewhat introverted as a person. So, right. um, so that was like a big change for me. Like, you know, I was just like, it needs to be done. And the only person for wrist enthusiasts, even though we have like other people that write and stuff that's going to do it is me. So, Makes you know, sense. and I'm the one like going to, you know, all the events and meeting with all the brands and stuff like that. So I was like, if anyone's going to do this, like I have to do it. But yeah. Getting that first like YouTube video up there. I think someone told me, and I, I tell the story a lot and I look dead behind my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh my God. But it's funny. Like, you know, like I like was a deer in the headlights. I mean, but that video got like 40 or 50,000 views Dude, and it's like, it's like, yeah. I, I do, I do look like I don't know what I'm doing. Like it looks very scripted and everything, but you know what I like also about you, Ben, and I wanted to say this and what you've been doing recently too, Derek, is that the kind of like off the cuff, not highly produced stuff allows people to like, that may not feel comfortable like getting into it, like the hobby or getting into you know, doing, you know, like watch reviews and stuff like that. Like, oh, I can do this too. I'm not saying that like it will do as well because a lot of what Ben does, I think, is he knows how to create a hook and get people in yeah. and like create That's like a video good. that will do I, really I, I well. I watch a few of the hooks. So, <laughs> so I'm not trying to say that like you're like kind of like off the cuff, like, you know, not highly produced stuff is bad in any means. I think it's great. And I think the fact that like you like have gotten some of this down to a science about how to like hook people in and keep them keep them watching is like very impressive and maybe more impressive than a lot of you know, like highly produced stuff. Um, but the fact that like someone looks at something, it's like, Oh, I can do that too. I, I think it's great to get more people like creating in, in the industry. So couldn't agree that more. type of content, it's a lot like, of studying. I'm sure you see that too, like watching other people and it's not like copying is bad. Like Derek said before. Um, but you're, you're finding things like, oh, I liked that a lot. I'm going to include some portion of what that was in my yeah. content. And just sort of like, I used to study heavily when I was doing TikTok. They had these like retention graphs and you can yeah. see like yeah. in a minute video, how many people are watching to the end, how many people are watching in three seconds. I study that like crazy. I don't do this much now and I should, I just don't have time to. Yeah. Um, but I used to watch a ton of Mr. Beast. Yeah, yeah. It's like for the last couple of years, um, I still watch his videos literally just to learn from him. Yeah. Because that's all he cares about is retention and most views possible. Well, and that's not, I care about as much. I care about what I like to make, but it helps. But like, you like, you like to make something, right? Like I did a Hermes uh, video of their uh, minute repeater turbion. Mm -hmm. I forget exactly what the name is. And I'm not going to do something French. Um, but like someone was like, yeah, like you need to like, like if you give like a sneak peek of, of of like part of the video that's most interesting, people are gonna stay and like watch to the end. So I did like a little bit of the minute repeater timing at the beginning and was like, this is the most complicated Hermes watch ever made. And, and then I don't, I did like three or four seconds of that. Then I get into like all the details and you don't see like the full time till the end. And that video did really well. And like Ben said, that's not copying anyone. That's just like it's strategies, like best practice, best practices. Yeah. yeah. I think in the beginning of like my own YouTube journey, I did, I was watching a lot of other YouTubers. Like obviously Teddy is one of them that I, you know, always looked up to and I always liked his content. Um, but then even when I first met Teddy, like a year ago, I think the one of the things I told him was like, I was already doing short form of time. I was like, Oh, like, just so you know, like I have no intention to be like you or do anything yeah. that you do. Like, I like what you do, but I don't want to be you. I want to be me. I, like, straight up told him that. And I think that's, like, where our friendship started, yeah. <laughs> in a way. Because I, I, I wanted to make it clear, like, I'm not here to, like, copy what you're doing. And I respect you a lot. Um, but, like, in the beginning, you, you have to do it that way because you just need to learn what's the standard for, like, what yeah. everyone is doing. And then I was also watching a lot of Mr. Beast. I still watch him a lot today. And I realized that Mr. Beast's culture has impacted so many types of, like, uh, what's it called? Content yeah. because yeah. he's very high retention. I used to study a lot of retention graphs and all that stuff too. But like earlier, I was mentioning I was listening to MKBHD and people were asking him like, "Okay, everyone is doing like a Mr. Beast video style hook and everything. How come you haven't done any of that?" And he was like, "He was like, oh, very simply, like my audience. He's like, I respect my audience, and I think my audience is v vastly different than Mr. Beast. Yeah. My audience is like." they're either going to buy some tech product and that might be like $10,000 or a thousand dollars. And he's like, and I think that they would rather me talk to them in a way where like we're talking right now, like as if we're just at a bar or a cafe, just chatting. 
And that's how he he's just stays so consistent with that style that it doesn't his retention and you know people come for him because of like what they know what they're gonna get yeah. from his videos. Yeah. And I've been thinking about that a lot lately too. Like, and I think that's just like another evolution yeah. in like growing as a content creator is like now that I've like done what all the best practices are. I realize that sometimes when you just like make yeah like on YouTube, if you make a title that just sounds human, yeah, it just like it does better than like putting all the ad words keywords like yeah. top watches and wonders watches twenty twenty four yeah like maybe you can be like I had a great time this year at watches and wonders and then people are gonna click because yeah. it feels like oh it's cool story like I want to hear the story now yeah it's yeah not like just the watches itself that's what I also like about YouTube is like we do like versus Google search we we have a blog and our blog does really well. Um, but a lot of it is, you know, SEO search driven, whereas YouTube is also a Google product. But what I've noticed is most of your views come from like the browse and suggested video feature, which is not like people searching really, you get some from search, but for me, all my videos like have been highly, uh, like the traffic from suggested or browse, which to me shows that like, you don't need to have that, like, really yeah like keyword driven thing and you can make it a little bit more creative and, and and you can also do like you don't have to do like the best this or the best that you can kind of create content that you like to create a little bit more than just tr trying to create content for traffic yeah i've always looked at it too like when it comes to seo and like keywording the watches it's like people who come to our page or my page is not because they typed in Minutemon or Carrot Co. They might have typed in the word Cartier Santos Medium, yeah. and that's how they found me. And so that's why I, I think it's so important because like I don't ever want to feel like I'm bigger than what brought people to me in the first place. And sometimes I'll do a video on something that's not a watch, like I did one on the Smart Rings, yeah. and that was like another way. That was just something I wanted to do for fun, but like that was another new audience of people who come in. Are you wearing it? I'm not wearing it today. <laughs> the battery's dead, so I guess he didn't like it that much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the there whoop. you go. Yeah, He's got the Whoop like Man. Yeah, yeah. I would like to talk about that on another time. <laughs> <laughs> that's something I'm interested in. Um, but uh, no, I I agree with you, and I think. I, this YouTube is the one thing that I've struggled with. Like I post all my videos in shorts. So like I have some, like a good amount of subscribers, but making the videos is very hard to translate one-to-one, -one, at least for yeah. me. And I find that YouTube doesn't take as kindly, which is wrong to the more like off the cuff iPhone type video. It just doesn't. And I think it's like MK, MK, MKBHD. I always call him smart cast Brownlee, but yeah. and he's cool. But his stuff, even though it's very talk to the camera, it's super high quality. Yo, yo, his, yeah, his quality is high. Like yeah. it's still 4K. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. The editing is probably nothing. It's like literally like a couple B-roll footage and yeah. talking to the camera 90%. I like watching his car videos. That's why I watch. Yeah, um, I mean, that's his brand. I mean, MKB is his name, uh, Marquez, Marquez Brown Lee. I, I don't remember. I'm, yeah. I'm going to butcher it. But HD is high definition. MKB yeah, high definition, HD, yeah. So that's why everything is in HD. <laughs> it's super HD too. Um, and it's like the way he talks to the camera. You just it's, it's almost like nobody else could do it. Yeah, that's what's so cool about it. So I think that's our pod for today. Yeah. What What are you guys working on? What are, What do you got going on for, you know, the rest of the week? Um, I'm I have some other content content ideas I got to work on this week, awesome. but I actually really enjoyed this conversation because. I've gotten invited to talk on other um, shows and podcasts before, and it's either it, like I've never gotten. I always want to talk about Minutemon because yeah. like that's something that I do on my side on my personal time. Yeah. But like what I do for Carrot and Co is to, is like a whole different podcast I could talk yeah. about, and um, what watches I like to collect is like a whole different podcast. Yeah. And I've done those already. I haven't gone to sit down with other people that create content and just talk about content. Yeah. So and awesome. I'm super like wired into that. And that's why I'm like so excited to do this because yeah. I feel like even if you don't create content, if you're someone watching this now, you don't create content, you'll find it interesting about like behind the scenes about yeah. how we think about things or how we create or why we do certain things. And then when you watch other creators, you'll start to pick up on them too. Yeah. yeah. And it just like, maybe one day you do want to create content and you'll notice it. But like, um, I know I have some friends who like study content and they don't even produce anything, but they just are so fascinated yeah. about behind the scenes. That's literally 
every video I watch now, I it's, it's almost like I can't even watch them. Like, why did this work? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like yeah. some videos, there's no hook, there's no anything, and it just like gets 10 million views. You're like, I need to figure that out. But what I wanted to do, obviously, with this, and why I thought Ben would be a great addition, and why I thought now you, Derek, would be a great addition, is while we all do content creation, we're all kind of from like different worlds at the same time you come from you know an ad background so you have like this different perspective i you know have like a i write a lot and do blog and all that stuff like so while i do a lot of content creation and while i started on instagram i feel like i have a more traditional kind of watch publishing background and then ben has kind of like the tiktok the younger uh, a, off yeah. the cuff stuff background so i feel like three different perspectives while we're all doing some of the same stuff at the same time. So I always found that just, I found that would be very interesting to people, which that, I don't think people are doing. That's exactly why I was excited to come on this because yeah. I knew all of our perspectives were so different. And that like, I knew that personally for me, I would learn something from both of you guys. And mm -hmm. I hope that I can also share a lot of things that I've learned along the way too. Getting all the behind the scenes stuff from the brands. I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So we're talking about all. behind the, yeah, <laughs> off camera. There'll be some stuff I can share in the future, but I'll never name drop anyone unless like, <laughs> no. I don't care anymore. <laughs> no, I won't say anything. What do you got going Listen, on then? Um, this weekend, I'm, well, in two days, this is a Thursday, right? Today's the third day. I lost track too. I'm running a half marathon Saturday, oh, so I'm really, really concerned with that. What watch are you going to wear? Any I'm watch? wearing a Garmin. I actually tried to contact Which makes sense. Kane, who sponsors the New York City Marathon, and I was like, I'd love to run, because I know some creators actually have run in Norcane. I'm like, how cool would that be? Yeah. Like, um, It just didn't work out, but I'm running in a Garmin. So oh, okay. that's, why, yeah. that's why I'm well, running good watch. Luck. What's yeah. your... Uh, what time do you hope to? Uh, I'm not the fastest runner. Okay. I'm very new. I ran my first mile ever when I was 22. Oh, I was a cross country runner in high school. Oh, so I was you captain of my cross country. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I'm running like 215. I'd be super happy. It's not bad. No, it's, no, it's, it's really not bad. Yeah. It's not bad. But when I compare it to my friends who are also running, it to me it's, it's the long way. Yeah. Ben's 6'4". 6'4". Six, four. Six, four, six, yeah. Four, seven, yeah. Not yeah. light. So Actually, maybe you can't tell as much from. from yeah, that's gonna sound more straight. <laughs> They're saying no. <laughs> Dude, but um, major props. I hope good luck with the half marathon. I, I respect people who run. I am not <laughs> like I can, I like sprinting more than I like running long. You sprint a lot, Eric. Huh? Do you sprint a lot these days? <laughs> I was sprinting yesterday to the train. You know, in New York City. Yeah, that's true. I, so, you know, I'm conditioned for that, you know? Fair enough, yeah. Well, we'll link to all of the socials, to Derek, to Minimon, to Carrot & Co., obviously to Ben and to wrist enthusiast stuff. Um, but yeah, I think this was a great first Perfect. new podcast and we're gonna be doing a lot more of this and hopefully some interviews and stuff with people in the industry and maybe other content creators as well. Awesome. I'm excited. Thank you guys for having me on. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in the next one. See you next time. <laughs>